Today's episode is sponsored by Zola, the platform built with wedding pros for wedding pros. Zola believes in a better way to get in front of couples. Stay tuned to find out how they make it a reality. Hey, it's Andy Kushner, and this is The Wedding Biz. And those of you who have been listening for at least a few episodes or longer will notice that I have been doing practically the same exact intro episode to episode for a very long time now. And I've been, I don't know, I've been like, I've been going through for months now, really feeling kind of bored creatively. I mean, I'm still, I have amazing things going on in my life. Amazing. And the music business is kicking ass and I love doing the podcast, all that stuff. But I just, I just felt like there was something, I don't know, something I needed to do. I needed to shake things up because I like that. I like not, not exactly living on the edge, but I definitely, I love adventure. I love uh, challenging myself with, with new things and learning and growing and evolving. And there come, there's, of course, there's a lot of growing pains with that kind of thing. I'm well aware of that. But I've been going through something. And of course, the universe answered, or rather, I was chilled out enough to be open and listening because that's a huge part of it because I think there's constantly gifts that are coming our way that we don't necessarily see. And anyway, amongst some other books, which I'll be talking about that I've been listening to. I'm into these audiobooks. I've been listening to the audiobook version about creativity by the record producer Rick Rubin. I mean, this guy is in, in very well, very known for being not only an incredibly gifted, talented uh, record producer who can help artists bring out just the deep soul and heart of who they are. But he, ha- he has a way of doing it that's very unique. So, Rick Rubin wrote this book called The Creative Act, A Way of Being. And in it, he talks about how we create these rules for ourselves that we are not even necessarily conscious of, but that we do over and over to the point where we think it's the only way, the right way to do something. Like, for instance, the way I've been introducing the show. So, so I think... And I don't really know yet, but I think that I'm going to talk about living life as a creative and the challenges as well as the quote unquote successes, uh, you know, the real shit. So, of course, that's also a big part of what the show is about and the interviews or the conversations that you're listening to. However, I'm going to talk about what I'm observing from week to week and going through. So, in any case, let me introduce today's guest. But first, let me mention that last week's episode was a revisit of my 2018 interview with Pablo Oliveira of Nuage Design. Pablo is a great guy, and that was a really great interview. So, today's guest is none other than Rishi Patel. He first came onto the show in 2019, which we revisited in episode 422. And that was a great conversation. You should definitely go back and listen to that. We get into his whole backstory and so much more about his process and and a lot that you would really love it. Rishi Patel, CEO of HMR Designs, a premier event design and production firm based out of Chicago, named one of the top wedding and event designers in the world by Harper's Bazaar, Vogue, Brides, and Martha Stewart Weddings, along with being recognized as top 40, under 40. Enjoy this new conversation with Rishi Patel. Hey, Rishi, it's so good to have you back on the show again. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Rishi, you had, from from what I understand, an outrageous year last year with the level of weddings and events that you and your firm have designed. I mean, man, congratulations. It's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, we've been um, certainly so fortunate and, you know, I'm, I am tremendously grateful for so many different types of clients and just the diversity of events we were able to be exposed to in the last, I would say almost from, you know, the fall of 2021 through the end of last year has been, you know, incredible and beyond our wildest dreams in terms of the ability to have to push and reinvent and to how to make things happen, you know, basically pulling things out of thin air sometimes in some situations, uh, given very little lead time and little resources as, you know, the demand of labor and prices were drastically increasing one way and the demand was also increasing even higher was a radical time to be in this world. 
Yeah. Well, when you don't have much lead time, you know, you just mentioned there's some where there's just not much lead time. I mean, I guess what, what do you do? You just have to kind of figure it out, right? Even though you're already busy, your teams are already super busy. I mean, you don't want to turn down some of these really big high profile events, right? So what do you do? <laughs> that's a, that's a very crazy thing we learned well last year. You know, I, I always say, I feel like the pandemic taught me how to write a whole book on itself. And then I feel like 2021 taught me the sequel to that book. And the 2022 was a trilogy. You know, so I feel like the amount of things I've learned in the last three years has been, I just never thought I would learn that in my entire career. Um, but, you know, I think that when we, and we've been in, a situ- in this situation many times, you know, the first thing is really assessing what is that displacement cost to take on something like that. Because like you mentioned, we all have given, you know, our, our our list of clients and events that we've already booked that we're working on and that need to be somewhat displaced or schedules need to be rearranged to really make time for, you know, this new event that you weren't planning on doing in such a short time period, which does put a strain on everybody, teams, schedules, you know, existing clients, new clients, etc. So I think understanding what that is, that displacement value and what that time value is going to be. And if it's worth it is the first reason to take something on. Um, And many times we've had to say, listen, this is not going to be possible or that we're already fully committed. And then some that we cannot handle an additional, you know, um, strain to this process. Um, So, you know, really we've learned upfront how to do that, but yeah, it's been, um, it's been, you know, I always say that when we're in these short term situations, that it's, that it's, it's, a lot easier for in some situations for clients and for us. And it's a lot harder in many situations. And the harder part is having to be able to ask for trust um, from a client that you don't nearly know as much as if you have been working with them for a year. Um, but really saying like, listen, this is going to be a, a, a tight ride, a quick ride, maybe bumpy a little bit, but you, we got, we, you, we need that trust to be able to roll and move forward. Um, and we will, you know, obviously keep you abreast of, anything that changes or things that come up our way. But moving forward, this is how we have to work to make this happen. And I think that's been a very um, pivotal part of the success of, of, of us being able to pull these things off. Oh, you mean managing expectations is what we're talking about, right? Managing expectations of clients, but also just the overall macro level trust factor. We best for trust from all of our clients, you know, when we start any project, but especially in, in tightened timelines, like that trust almost needs to increase tenfold, which is ironic because you're talking about clients who have now just started working with an entirely new team in the last, you know, a couple of months leading up to an event. So, yeah. Well, I also want to um, ask about, or, or get into a little bit about collaboration. I mean, from what I understand, you are not doing planning. It's really strictly design, right? Design production. That's that's what you're doing. A hundred percent. Yes. Um, you know, I a lot of these projects that we do and excel at and that we love doing are very, very complicated projects, many times, you know, in locations where events have never happened before and probably will never happen again. So it's not that we can really thrive off of infra- infrastructure that's been created or thrive off of previous vendors who've come in and that I could call and hopefully friends with to find out like, hey, how'd you deal with this? Or, you know, a lot of times it's us figuring it out on our own. So I always say that those kind of events really take two really strong partners. So not only the planner, but they, there needs to be a strong designer and production partner involved to let that project thrive and become what it needs to be and make sure that it's executed perfectly because we have one shot, the event's going to happen on a certain date. And, you know, and especially when you have no prior event history in that specific location, sometimes with the team perhaps that have not worked together before, um, that the strength of those partners really dictates the success of the event. Well, and I'm thinking, especially when you go out of the States, you know, when you're going overseas, you're going to some small country or something like that, and you've got all of that to factor in as well. I imagine that that just takes it to a whole nother level of complication and then talk about trust. Wow. <laughs> Beyond. And, you know, last year we did a, a crazy project up in Anguilla and to some of we had, we were trucking out, sorry, not trucking, shipping um, almost 38 containers of you know, tenting of audiovisual equipment, of decor, furniture, rentals. We had to bring every fork, knife, plate, spoon into that country for seven days of events. Um, So you can imagine that. But um, we were still dealing with COVID at the time. It was first quarter of last year. Um, So at the time, you know, Anguilla had a 
policy where you had to quarantine yourself for 24 hours while your PCR test that you got upon arriving results came through. So, you know, we were looking at, okay, listen, we could roll in there and 25% of my team could be out, which, in which case you have to isolate right. in your hotel room for a week. I'm like, and this event's happening. Like, what do we do? So the ability to have to staff up to explain those risks to a client and, you know, explain those risks to our team who's going out there. I mean, that has not even one thing to do with a single pretty thing, right? It's all about infrastructure and logistics. And, you know, so much of that does dictate the success of a pretty installation or a pretty event um, without, without that knowledge and that infrastructure and the logistical understanding of what it takes to pull that off, you don't have anything pretty. Yeah, incredible. You know, I want to ask you, one of the high-profile weddings that you worked on that, that's public, you know, so uh, publicly known, is uh, Bill Gates' daughter, Jennifer Gates. And, and I believe that was with Marcy Bloom. Is that right? It was, yes. Can you tell me anything about that process of an ultra-lux kind of wedding and how that goes? And, and again, you're collaborating with someone like Marcy. Yeah, I mean, you know, that was such an incredible experience and nothing but amazing things to say about the team and obviously Marcy and, you know, but the client too is, and we talked about this from a short term period perspective of having that trust. Um, you know, we really felt, you know, sometimes you get these situations where like, it's just meant to be, um, the teams, the people, like we were given a very short, um, period of time, the matter of 10 days to put a, almost a full design together without having have met the client without having seen the property, having do, doing any of that, almost just blind. Um, and, you know, coming up with some inspirations and ideas and some rough ideas that Marcy was able to communicate to us um, of what the client wanted. You know, we really came up with that and had 10 days to put a design together. Um, and we went, went out there, met with the clients for the first time and presented it. And really, when I say things are meant to be, it was just like the perfect harmony. And they were just so happy like they're like we don't even know how you knew our style without us having to say a thing and i was like i don't know how we figured that out either but i'm so grateful we did uh, but it was just like just pure magic from the start and from that one was you know met with great trust and great you know admiration from us to them and them to us and it was just an incredible experience from start to finish and can you say anything about i mean i know you could probably talk for hours about this but in terms of kind of a summary version your process with your team when you get something like this, you've got only 10 days, like just generally speaking, how do you rally the team together and, and how do you manage it if you can talk to that? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, it, it's we work in two different ways. So we not two different ways. We work with two different teams. So I'd say the first team is our internal team here um, of, you know, designers, artisans, like production masterminds um that's all internal here that you know is pretty turnkey in terms of different types of projects different types of timelines different types of expectations across the board because my team here at, at hmr manages you know up to sometimes 300 events in a year given small scale to large so um a whole full gamut so really that is one part of it the other part of it is our creative partners that we rely on that that really you know are pivotal in production. So what that means is, you know, while we do produce everything from floral fabric, furniture, art and graphics, we have a wood shop building shop, all of that here within the four walls of my company. Um, we do heavily rely on amazing partners when it comes to tenting, when it comes to lighting, AV tech, when it comes to landscaping, things that, you know, that you don't necessarily think of as part of an event that are really important when it comes to other projects or projects such as the one you're asking about. Um, you know, those kind of things are really important. And a lot of those things are structural, which, you know, it's like when you're building a house, like you have to start with an architect and a structure plan first before you can figure out what pretty couch you're going to put into the living room. And in the same facet, we need to really, as designers, understand the full extent of what we're able to create given I always say there's three barriers, right? Or three at least restrictions. One could be budget. Another could be time, and the third could be space. So those three restrictions, we oftentimes deal with all three. Sometimes you're dealing with two. Sometimes you're dealing with none, which is rare. Um, but you know, when those things, you really have to evaluate what is possible given those restrictions, and then really start from the biggest piece, which is usually infrastructure structure. In that case, we built these beautiful custom tents and had to figure out could could these be built in time for installation to happen. You know. Uh, all, and given, you know, in 2021, when that wedding happened, things were very different, like with supply chain and, you know, lots of inventory issues and labor issues. So really, we started from that. And then, you know, once we were able to creatively come up with those 
those structures and tents, and then we get into finishes of what is the floor, what's the ceiling, what are, what is this, what's that, and then finally we get into finishings, which are sorry, furnishings, which are tables, linens, floral decor, concept design, all with the understanding of okay, we wanted to do this amazing ceiling installation, and we need to make sure that this tent structure we're creating from scratch can hold that from a weight perspective. You know, so there's so many facets where it comes to engineering and you know architecture and logistics that have almost nothing to do with the pretty, but have everything to do with the pretty. If that makes any sense. Yeah, sure. Zola initially revolutionized registries and wedding websites, but did you know that they're now changing the game for wedding pros too? That's because Zola is a different kind of platform, one built for how you work today. Create free listings tailored to your services that make your business look great, and there's no subscription required. Connecting with couples has never been easier. Zola vets all leads to bring you real couples who are a great fit for you in terms of your fee, your expertise, and your style. So gain control and grow your business with transparent, pay-to-connect pricing. Create your free listing and get your first few connections for free at Zola.com forward slash Andy. That's Z-O-L-A dot com forward slash Andy. I want to take this in a different direction now, too. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, Rishi, you're relatively young, you know, to, I mean, in, in the industry as far as managing such a, a big company with everything going on. I know that you're married, you're a father. Um, how how do you stay grounded, you know? And then following that is how do you stay inspired? I mean, it, it just seems, you know, I mean, I get into places where I am feel overwhelmed and of course it's hard to do that. And, and lately, a lot of my personal work has been, what can I do to, to stay grounded and to, and, and to not be so overwhelmed and busy that I lose that sense of inspiration and the fun and the passion and the love for what I do? How do you look at all of that? Yeah, and you know, and it's a great question, and I feel like I wish I had the right answer because I think I'm still trying to find it. Um, but and I think I'll probably spend all my career finding it. Right. <laughs> there are things that definitely ground me or make me feel more inspired or make me feel more just in touch with the world or with nature that has nothing to do with events. Um, but again, it's inspiration for events. So I think you know the first thing, obviously, family. Any time that you can spend with friends and family that's outside of the workplace that, you know, gives you another perspective on life is always a huge thing. But when it relates to actual elements, for me, that's keep me inspired. And, you know, I'll tell you in the last two years, it's been very hard to make time for this because it's just been incredibly fast paced and flying by the seat of our pants, it felt like times, but really trying to make it make an effort to make it out to museums to make it out to different areas. I you know, go to buying shows a lot um, in Europe and Asia across the US, um, where it comes to and, you know, being immersed in different areas that have relation to events, but not fully such as the interior design world, uh, the, the world of architecture, um, and really trying to stay up on top of those things, even though they don't have anything to do with the specific project we're working on, but how right, they right. correlate to a future project or a future idea. Um, I feel like pre pandemic, I had a lot more time to do those things, but just the onslaught of events back to back to back over the last two and a half years have really limited that ability to do so. But this year, it's been great that this, at least this first quarter, we've been able to make time to do that again and really make sure that that's part of our day to day, um, you know, or week to week or month to month um, processes and projects that I'm able to stay inspired, whether it's just taking a trip to the local botanical garden or um, going to Paris for a buying show or, you know, whatever the case is that it doesn't, again, have anything related to a specific project. Um, right, but right. Really just staying inspired is what, what keeps me going. And I think, you know, as a designer, I've always said this, and I will continue to say this, that we don't, we start to work when our eyes open in the morning and, you know, we stop when our eyes finally close and sometimes not even then because we don't sleep. So, you know, it just, it just, and, and we absorb everything we see. So trying to be in the right places to see the right things is almost, the, you know, the name of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what is, you know, other than, than that, what we're talking about just now, what, what's the hard part? Like, what do you still struggle with? I, I mean, here's what I'm thinking as, as artists, and maybe I'm speaking more for myself, but you know, I think we angst over various things at different times and it, it just seems to come with the territory, you know, whether, you know, are we still good enough or are, have we, a, a, you know, we've accomplished enough, we've accomplished a lot. How do we keep that up? You know, are we going to be able to keep 
you know, that, that level at such a high level and even keep going up? I mean, are you, <laughs> I'm just going to ask straight out, do you angst about, are you angsting over anything lately? What's the, the struggle in this for you? Well, I mean, I think always, right? Always, like as an entrepreneur, especially in an event industry that is not fully cyclical and it's not predictable by any means. And especially after coming off of the two of the craziest years that probably I think anyone in the industry would say we've had. So, you know, I think that there is a lot of, not that it, I see it as a challenge and I see it as a great perspective to learn and not everything we do is the right thing to do, but we learn from those mistakes and get stronger. Um, but, you know, I think that for us, because we have such a big production team and a lot of overhead, it's managing that team and where we're going for the future, not just growth wise, but capabilities. Like, are we expanding capabilities? We just bought this mother load printer that we had to build a whole room for because it can print now 12 feet you know, in size, like it's crazy things that we, that we do, but we look at that and say, okay, how does this play into our overall strategy? How does it play into our next year? How does it play into the next five years? You know, and that's a printer, but now we talk about infrastructure of staff. We talk about our scalability of actual production. It talks about like, what is our focus going to be for this next five years? So it's always this reevaluation of how much overhead do we need to keep up with what we are producing and then how much we want to produce to keep up with the overhead and at some point you're gonna be like okay i think this is good you know and looking at last year we knew like i knew that while we're getting through it we did you know thank goodness with the, the amazing support of partners and a team that we got through it flawlessly but you know we that was not sustainable and you know looking at this year we're like okay you know we need to really in order to keep keep our employees and our team and our clients in mind, we want to be 20 to 25% less in volume this year than we did last year because huh. that to me is more sustainable than, yeah. and even the idea of us being at where we were last year would be a fictitious thought because that was, you know, again, so much overflow and backflow of events that were relocated plus new events and just an insane time in the economy, which we're also now, you know, and that's another thing too. Like we don't know what's going to happen with the war in Ukraine, with other things happening here stateside with, you know, obviously political agendas and different things being pushed in different areas of the country. Those are all things we are unknown. But what we do know is what we know what our core base is. We know what our bread and butter is. And to focus on that is always to me the most safe and the best strategy moving forward and then obviously now you know as of the last five six years destinations have become a big part of our business too and it's like okay of those destinations what is our core destination there is always a core there's always a bread and butter when you boil anything down and to keep that focus to that and really take the frivolous things out of your expectations out of your projections to out of those kind of things is i think the best way to you know hopefully take the edge off of the unknown which we all have and but you know that that's been my best way to mitigate that you know, that's interesting. I, I, I think you're making such a great point here. I think for any entrepreneur, you know, a, a business owner to really identify, like you're talking about, what is the core and what is the true strengths, you know, and uh, who is it? I'm trying to remember, I'm, I'm blanking out on his name right now. Someone who talks about his zone of genius, you know, versus what we can be really, really good at, but where, where is our ultimate abilities and skill set, and, you know, where we can really be productive and efficient and, and again, go with what our, our core is and where we're really strong and just kind of shave away all the other stuff. Yep. And, and again, like, you know, what, if we were to forecast based on last year, or anyone in our industry were to do that, they would likely, and, and I hope not, but likely be met with a lot of not great things this year. We, I think looking at the reality of what that was and what the reality of the world really being, like, I do hope in the next year that, you know, obviously inflation dies down, prices somewhat start to come down too. But, you know, we were, we were up against a crazy year last year where we were coming up to clients and saying, listen, you could have had this exact same party. And even this year up till now, you could have had this exact same party in 2019 before the pandemic for half the cost of what it's going to cost you. And that's a hard thing to have to deliver and not the best conversation to have. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think clients appreciated that and understood it. Um, but we are hoping that those things do come down and kind of, you know, normalize to some extent, knowing that they'll never fully go back. And if they do, it's not going to be for at least a decade, um, if that. But, you know, for the time being, at least if we see a 20% reduction, that would be great. Um, but, you know, just being smart about how we're projecting and what we're really looking for as you know, when we all set goals, like the goal has to be achievable or and it needs to push you and needs to keep you, you know, energized and with it, it shouldn't be a cakewalk, but it also needs to be 
realistic. And I think that's trying to base anything off of the last two years would not be realistic in any method for our industry specifically. Yeah. And, and Rishi, just one or two more questions. I want to say, you know, I mentioned earlier, you've, you know, you've accomplished so much already. You've got this stellar reputation. Is there anything, I mean, I want to dig deep on this one. Is there anything about you in particular, your talent, or I'll, I'll put it this way. What is it about you that makes you good at what you do? You know, what, what do you feel that is? Well, thank you, Andy. I think, you know, I'm, I'm also every day, like, so grateful to be where we're at. And so look at my team thriving and being so happy in what we do and it couldn't be possible without just the amazing trust and not and chance and you know opportunities i've been given in my life so i'm so grateful for that but you know i think the what our strong skill set is is we're able to look at a project from its entirety and understand what it's going to take to actually pull it together and then pull it together so physically pull it together understand the means of what that means and having amazing resources at all the corners of our country or even now even around the world to be able to pull those things together in the most sustainable way possible. So, you know, I think that it's easy for someone to just say, okay, we're going to bring stuff from New York to California. Like we're just going to truck it all and we'll figure it out. But that's not sustainable and that's not smart. So for us to be able to say, okay, we're going to bring these things here. We're going to source the rest locally. We have a fabricator there locally who can create this for us. We have labor in this, this, and this area of that side of the world and we're going to pull from there and bring our core team out there so it's really that we've created this like global f- footprint of labor and talent that we can pull from almost anywhere um where we where we you know really rely on that labor and that staff to be able to do it physically but also it's just the ability to look at a project from the beginning from that concept and creation be able to talk a client through why that is needed given what their vision is or what needs to be changed if it's out of scope to be able to pull it back in division. I think a lot of designers don't necessarily focus on that big, big, big picture like we do. Um, they rely on planners to do that. They rely on other people to do that. But I think it's only made our design stronger. And it's been our partnerships with planners even stronger, especially when we're in short you know, turnaround periods. Like a planner can't do everything because you have six weeks, you have eight weeks, you have Ten weeks to do something that our ability to manage the production end of the of the logistics and the operations of it only allows that team to be stronger and allows all of us to focus on what we're good at. So I think that's what's really helped differentiate what kind of product we're able to offer to our clients compared to other designers in the country. Yeah, I love that. And and last question before we go. So what, Rishi? What are you like personally really excited about now? Like like especially from a creative standpoint. What what do you, what's coming up? short term or even long term that you're just super jazzed about you know we're really super stoked about doing things in europe um this year we have some amazing projects abroad in europe which are going to be so fun and interesting to you know work on and do and we've done things in you know ireland and in um france and england um but these are different types of projects like more full-scale weddings and events which are really exciting in a series of weekend of events so um very excited about that and, you know and i think for us as a creative like we love doing things for the first time that haven't been done before so that obviously comes with a great amount of risk and sleepless nights to make sure it's perfect because we have one chance to make it perfect um but you know love working in new structures and new places whenever we get that opportunity to be in somewhere where either we haven't worked or or in a structure we've never seen or worked in, there's a new sense of excitement. So whenever we get the chance to do those things, it's always awesome. But then there's also this nostalgia and this joy and a big satisfaction I get from, it could be a place we've worked in 30 times, but it's a new perspective. It's working with a client who fully trusts you. And it's also perhaps even in a situation where you're excited about a design that you haven't done before. There's something great about that, about doing great events for great people is just as satisfying. And I think I've come now to a point in my career that unless I cannot find the joy in something of a project, I shouldn't be doing it. But I, I feel like we've been fortunate enough to find lots of joys in any type of project, whether it's here at Stateside, it's huge, it's small, it's great, it's a legacy client, it's a new client. Like, you know, we are able to find that. And I think that's the most important thing that keeps us going. Yeah. Well, geez, this has been such a fun catch up. Um, I don't know where the time goes. <laughs> we just covered a lot in a short period of time. So you like to talk, Andy, you know, what, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, thanks, Rishi. I mean, this has been great. And, and it's fun, you know, to be able to check in maybe every year or so with you and see what's going on. And, and I just continue to wish you all the best. Just keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. It's great chatting with you. And thanks for having me. Yeah. So thanks for listening to this wonderful conversation with Rishi Patel. 
You can find his website at hmrdesigns.com, on Instagram at hmrdesigns. And before I mention next week's guest, remember to go to zola.com forward slash Andy to create your free listing and get your first few connections for free. So next week's is going to be a new interview with planner extraordinaire, Jennifer Zabinski. And finally, if you could subscribe to The Wedding Biz so that you know whenever a new episode drops and follow us particularly on Instagram at The Wedding Biz and we'll catch you next week. <laughs>